Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video, we will be learning about the posterior triangle of the neck. To begin with, this diagram shows the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle right here. The posterior triangle is a space on the side of the neck situated behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle right here. Now let's learn about its boundaries. We will be learning about its anterior boundary, posterior boundary, the inferior or the base, apex, the roof of the triangle as well as the floor of the triangle. So beginning with the anterior boundary, it is bounded by the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle as you see right here. Looking at the posterior boundary, it is bounded by the anterior border of the trapezius muscle. The inferior or the base is made up of the middle one third of the clavicle bone and the apex lies on the superior nuchal line where the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid muscle meet that is right here. Now let's look at the roof of the posterior triangle of the neck. The roof is formed by the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. There is a superficial fascia that lies above it. We will be learning about the structures that can be seen in the superficial fascia. Now before we move on to the roof of the posterior triangle of the neck, Let's concise the points that we learnt under the features and the boundaries till now. The posterior triangle is a space on the side of the neck situated behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Looking at the boundaries, the anterior boundary is bounded by the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, posterior by the anterior border of the trapezius, the inferior or base by the middle one third of the clavicle and the apex lies on the superior nuchal line where the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles meet. Now to make it easier to remember, the superficial fascia over the posterior triangle of the neck contains certain muscles, arteries, veins, nerves and lymph vessels. Now we will be looking at each one of them. Looking at the first structure that is a muscle, we have the platysma that you see right here. Looking at the arteries, we have the occipital artery, transverse cervical artery and the suprascapular artery that you see right here. This is the trapezius muscle and this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now looking at the veins, we have the external jugular vein and the posterior external jugular vein right here. Looking at the nerves, there are the parts of the greater auricular nerve right here, the lesser occipital nerve, the transverse cutaneous nerve and the supraclavicular nerves right here. And so here. after having learned about the muscle, arteries, veins and nerves, finally we have the lymph vessels which pierce the deep fascia to end in the supraclavicular lymph nodes. Now there is one structure that is the external jugular vein that we have to learn in detail. So the external jugular vein lies deep to the platysma muscle. It is formed by the union of the posterior auricular vein that you see right here and the posterior division of the retromandibular vein right here. It begins within the lower part of the parotid gland it crosses the sternocleidomastoid muscle obliquely as you can see here. It pierces the antero-inferior angle of the roof of the posterior triangle and it opens into the subclavian vein right here. Looking at its tributaries, we have the posterior external jugular vein that you see right here, the transverse cervical vein, the suprascapular vein and the anterior jugular vein right here. Now the oblique jugular vein that you see here connects the external jugular vein with the internal jugular vein across the middle one third of the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle right here. Before moving on to the floor of the posterior triangle of the neck, let's concise the points that we learnt under the roof of the posterior triangle. It is formed by the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. The superficial fascia over the posterior triangle contains the platysma, the arteries that is the occipital, transverse cervical and suprascapular arteries, the veins that is the external jugular and the posterior external jugular veins, nerves that is the parts of supraclavicular, great auricular, transverse cutaneous and lesser occipital nerves and finally the lymph vessels which pierce the deep fascia to end in the supraclavicular nodes. Then we learnt about the external jugular vein. It lies deep to the platysma. It is formed by the union of the posterior auricular vein with the posterior division of the retromandibular vein. It begins within the lower part of the parotid, crosses the sternocleidomastoid obliquely, pierces the antero-inferior angle of the roof of the posterior triangle and opens into the subclavian vein. 
The tributaries are the posterior external jugular vein, the transverse cervical vein, suprascapular vein and the anterior jugular vein. The oblique jugular vein connects the external jugular vein with the internal jugular vein across the middle one third of the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now let's look at the floor of the posterior triangle of the neck. The floor of the posterior triangle is formed by the prevertebral layer of the deep cervical fascia and it covers these muscles that is the semispinalis capitis, the splenius capitis, levator scapulae and the scalenus medius right here. Concising the important points under the floor of the posterior triangle, it is formed by the prevertebral layer of the deep cervical fascia and it covers the following muscles that is the splenius capitis, levator scapulae, scalenus medius and semispinalis capitis. Now let's look at the divisions of the posterior triangle of the neck. It is subdivided by the inferior belly of the omohyoid muscle that you see right here into a large upper part which is called the occipital triangle right here and a smaller lower part which is called the supraclavicular or the subclavian triangle as you see right here. Concising the important points under the divisions of the posterior triangle, it is subdivided by the inferior belly of the omohyoid into a large upper part which is called the occipital triangle and a smaller lower part which is called the supraclavicular or the subclavian triangle. After having learnt about the boundaries of the posterior triangle, now we'll move on to the contents of the posterior triangle. So we'll be learning about the nerves of the occipital and subclavian triangle. Then we'll be looking at the vessels of the occipital and subclavian triangle. And finally the lymph nodes of the same. First let's learn about the nerves of the occipital triangle. We have the spinal accessory nerve, four cutaneous branches of the cervical plexus and the muscular branches. So first let's learn about the spinal accessory nerve in detail. In this diagram, you can see the trapezius muscle right here and here is the sternocleidomastoid. This structure is the spinal root of the accessory nerve. Now, the spinal accessory nerve emerges a little above the middle of the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid that is right here. It runs through a tunnel in the fascia forming the roof of the triangle, passing downwards and laterally and it disappears under the anterior border of the trapezius as you can see right here about 5 cm above the clavicle it is the only structure beneath the roof of the triangle concising the important points under the spinal accessory nerve it emerges a little above the middle of the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid it runs through a tunnel in the fascia forming the roof of the triangle passing downwards and laterally and disappears under the anterior border of the trapezius about 5 cm above the clavicle. It is the only structure beneath the roof of the triangle. Next we will be learning about the four cutaneous branches of the cervical plexus that is a greater auricular nerve, lesser occipital, anterior cutaneous nerve of the neck and supraclavicular nerves in detail. First let's look at the greater auricular nerve that you see right here. It is the largest ascending branch of the cervical plexus. It ascends on the sternocleidomastoid muscle as you can see right here and reaches the parotid gland where it divides into anterior and posterior branches. Here you can see the anterior and posterior branches of the greater auricular nerve more clearly. The anterior branch supplies the lower one third of the skin on the lateral surface of the pinna and the skin over the parotid gland and connects the gland to the auriculotemporal nerve. Now looking at the posterior branch, it supplies the lower one third on the skin of the medial surface of the pinna. Next we will learn about the lesser occipital nerve that you see right here. It arises from the ventral ramus of the C2 segment of the spinal cord. It is seen at the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle right here. It then winds around and ascends along its posterior border to supply the upper two-thirds of the medial surface of the pinna adjoining the part of the scalp that is right here. Next let's look at the transverse cutaneous nerve right here. It runs transversely across the sternocleidomastoid muscle to supply the skin of the neck till the sternum. Now let's learn about the supraclavicular nerves that you see right here. They emerge at the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid right here. They descend downwards and divide into three branches. This is one branch, this is the second and here is the third. Now the medial one, that is the one right here, supplies the skin over the manubrium 
till the manubrio-sternal joint. The intermediate nerve right here crosses the clavicle to supply the skin of the first intercostal space till the second rib. Finally, the lateral nerve runs across the lateral side of the clavicle and the acromion to supply the skin over the upper half of the deltoid muscle. Concising the important points that we have learned till now, the four cutaneous branches of the cervical plexus pierce the fascia covering the floor of the triangle, pass through the triangle and pierce the deep fascia at different points to become cutaneous. The four branches are the greater auricular nerve, the lesser occipital nerve, the transverse cutaneous nerve and the supraclavicular nerve. Under the greater auricular nerve, we learn that it is the largest ascending branch of the cervical plexus. It arises from the ventral rami of the C2 and C3 nerves. It ascends on the sternocleidomastoid muscle, reaches the parotid gland and it divides into anterior and posterior branch. The anterior branch supplies the lower one third of the skin on the lateral surface of the pinna and the skin over the parotid gland. The posterior branch supplies the lower one third of the skin on the medial surface of the pinna. Looking at the lesser occipital nerve, it arises from the ventral ramus of C2 segment of the spinal cord. It is seen at the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It winds around and ascends along its posterior border to supply the skin of the upper two-thirds of the medial surface of the pinna, adjoining the part of the spinal Moving on to the transverse cutaneous nerve and the supraclavicular nerve. The transverse cutaneous nerve arises from the ventral rami of C2 and C3 nerves. It runs transversely across the sternocleidomastoid to supply the skin of the neck till the sternum. Moving on to the supraclavicular nerve, it is formed from the ventral rami of C3 and C4 nerves. It emerges at the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. It descends downwards and diverges into the medial, intermediate and lateral nerve. The medial one supplies the skin over the manubrium till the manubrio-sternal joint. The intermediate nerve crosses the clavicle to supply the skin of the first intercostal space till the second rib. And finally, the lateral nerve runs across the lateral side of the clavicle and the acromion to supply the skin over the upper half of the deltoid muscle. Finally, we have the muscular branches. That is two small branches to levator scapulae, two small branches to trapeces and the nerve to rhomboid. Now after having learned about the nerves of the occipital triangle, let's learn about the nerves of the subclavian triangle. We have the roots and trunks of the brachial plexus, the nerve to serratus anterior, the nerve to subclavius and the suprascapular nerve. In this diagram we can see the brachial plexus. Here are the roots, these are the trunks. The green color shows divisions, the pink shows cords, and yellow shows branches. So the three trunks of the brachial plexus that you see right here emerge between the scalenus anterior muscle and the scalenus medius muscle and carry the axillary sheath around them. Now this sheath contains the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery and these structures lie deep to the floor of the posterior triangle. Three trunks of the brachial plexus emerge between the serratus anterior and the scalenus medius right here and they carry the axillary sheath around them. Next you can see the nerve to the serratus anterior also called the long thoracic nerve right here. It arises by three roots. The roots from C5 and C6 pierce the scalenus medius muscle and join the root from the C7 over the first digitation of the serratus anterior muscle. And this nerve passes behind, passes behind the brachial plexus. It descends and gives branches to the digitations of the serratus anterior muscle. As you can see in this picture, this is the long thoracic nerve. The nerve passes behind the brachial plexus. It descends over the serratus anterior and gives branches to the digitations of the muscle. Next, we can look at the nerve to subclavius right here. It descends in front of the brachial plexus. It runs near the lateral margin of the scalenus anterior muscle and gives off the accessory phrenic nerve. Then we have the suprascapular nerve right here that arises from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. It passes backwards over the shoulder to reach the scapula and it supplies the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus muscle. Concising the important points under the nerves of the subclavian triangle, we have the three trunks of the brachial plexus that emerge between the scalenus anterior and medius and carry the axillary sheath around them. The sheath contains the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery and these structures lie deep to the floor of the posterior triangle. Looking at the nerve to serratus anterior, also called as the long thoracic nerve, it arises by three roots. The roots from C5 and C6 pierce the scalenus medius muscle and join the root from the C7 
over the first digitation of the serratus anterior. The nerve passes behind the brachial plexus, it descends over the serratus anterior and gives off branches to the digitations of serratus anterior muscle. Looking at the nerve to subclavius, it descends in front of the brachial plexus and the subclavian vessels. It runs near the lateral margin of the scalenous muscle. Looking at the su suprascapular nerve, it arises from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus and crosses the lower part of the posterior triangle. It passes backwards over the shoulder to reach the scapula and it supplies the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus muscle. Now, after having learned about the nerves of the occipital triangle and the subclavian triangle, let's learn about the vessels of the occipital triangle. We have the transverse cervical artery and vein and the occipital artery. Here you can see the transverse cervical artery and here is the occipital artery. And here you can see the transverse cervical vein. Now let's look at the vessels of the subclavian triangle. We have the third part of the subclavian artery and subclavian vein, the suprascapular artery and vein, the commencement of the transverse cervical artery and the termination of the transverse cervical vein and the lower part of the external jugular vein. So first now, concising the contents of the posterior triangle of the neck in a tabular column, you can see the nerves of the occipital triangle and the subclavian triangle. The occipital triangle includes the spinal accessory nerve, the four cutaneous branches of cervical plexus and the muscular branches. And in the subclavian triangle, we can see the roots and trunks of the brachial plexus, nerve to serratus anterior, nerve to subclavius and the suprascapular nerve. Looking at the vessels in the occipital triangle, we have the transverse cervical artery and vein and the occipital artery. In the subclavian triangle, we have the third part of the subclavian artery and vein, the suprascapular artery and vein, the transverse cervical artery and the termination of the corresponding vein as well as the external jugular vein. Now looking at the lymph nodes, in the occipital triangle, it is seen along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. More are seen in the lower part, which are the supraclavicular nodes, and fewer at the upper angle, which are called the occipital nodes. And in the subclavian triangle, we have a few members of the supraclavicular chain. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the nodes of posterior triangle of neck, as well as other nodes of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, and other health science subjects, visit my website. The link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.